This is the hard part about teaching. <laughs> you have to do it backwards. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go in and cut the tuck up out. If you got Mr. Winky, stick your finger on it. They don't mind. And again, always hold your scissors this way when you're trimming edges. That way you don't get, and you cut it all off and then you can't figure out and you've pinched it all in. I always say the English saddle is the hardest to me because it's a work in progress and you get it set and you think you can relax and you can't. So I think that's probably the other reason why you don't see it a lot is because it's, it's, it's pretty intensive as far as upkeep goes as well. Because once you lose those lines, you pretty much have to start all over again. So now I'm trimming these because they're sticking out farther than what I did here. So we basically want to just follow that line. You know, we're always looking for parallel lines. Follow that line off the hip. And that'll show you how you want, how far out you want that side to stick out. So now you can see when you look from the rear that it's straight up and down but you still have, okay? So that's why you don't want those big round, that's why I tell everybody all the time when you're making bracelets, don't try to make it round. You're never gonna make it round and correct. It's, you're just gonna fight it and it's gonna drive you crazy. I was talking to her here, I do really see how maintenance on it upkeep. Yeah. Because the continental is much this, easier. This, yeah, this is yeah. a shake down. Yeah. Right. Upkeep. Yeah. That's scissoring. Yeah, this is this is a lot of scissoring and a lot of upkeep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you do and that's that's one of the other reasons too that I think that you know when judges see it they think, "Oh, you're working awful hard for something," you know. So when I show him in this, I, they always I'll see the judge a couple of times will pick up his rear and do this and, you know, just to make sure that he actually has the angulation that's there. That's that's the only thing I've noticed different about when they're judging it. I I notice they definitely take um extra time to make sure Huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. I don't mind. Yep. Mm hmm. That's right. Now, let's talk. I mean, showing him in the mm -hmm. grooming competition. Uh huh. If you, to, you just said something about an angulation of a dog, but in the grooming competition, you're grooming. Right. It's about how you can actually. Right. You can make it look like that, yes. So they're mm -hmm. looking for that too, or they're doing that? Um, they will, let me right put it, let me put it this way. It is right to do, because they will notice. And they will realize that you understand the breed standard of that dog. that you use mm -hmm. it Yep. I certified on the shortest, fattest Scotty you've ever seen in your life. But I made him look like he wasn't. Okay. And I got a 98. There you go. Clipper. That, that's what I wanted to understand. Okay. You know, so if, if I didn't do the scissoring exactly right, you know, or whatever, I probably would have got a little bit of a lower score, but because I did that and I did it correctly and I fixed whatever I could to make that dog look like he should, that got me an even higher grade. There we go. You know, now if I had come in with a perfect Scotty and done the same thing, I probably would have gotten the same grade, but I didn't have access to a perfect Scotty or even a close to perfect Scotty. So I borrowed one 
and that's what I got and so but I knew the breed standard and I fixed it the best that I could and both of the certifiers gave me I think one gave me a 98 and another one gave me a 99 and that was a redo I failed my short-legged terrier the first time so just so you know <laughs> we're not all perfect ever <laughs> I had to redo yep I had to I had to redo my terrier certification both my long-legged and my short-legged which one's the hardest? Whichever one's the hardest is the one you think is the hardest. Some people think poodles are the hardest. Some people think uh, Bedlington Terrier trim is horrible and difficult, and I think it's one of the easiest things I've ever done in my life. So, Just whatever yep, whatever you feel better with first, that's what you should start with. Because that will, that's going to build, that'll build your confidence and help you to understand, you know, that you're not perfect and you're not ever going to be perfect. A lot of times it's just access to what dog you have. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. The poodle I certified on had like no neck. I mean, it was it was bad. It was, you know, but I did what I did. But if you know the standard and you can make those corrections and you can use your scissors to make those corrections or your clippers, yeah. Especially for certification, they like to see that. Yes. I'm going to ask you a question as an answer. Why aren't you charging more to begin with? Not charging more right now. You know, okay. That, that That's your answer. You know, if you're charging what you're worth, then you have time for that. Perfect. And you can do that. Obviously, if it's, you know, if, if, if you have a slower-ish day and you've got somebody that comes in with something overgrown like this and you want to do practice on it and they're leaving the dog all day while they're at work, yeah. go for it and then shave it with a seven. Use it for your practice. But don't charge the customer more for something you want to do. But if they like how the dog looks, if they, yeah, if they, I'm taking advantage because I'm learning with each of the different Right. Yeah. Don't let them take advantage of you. Charge what you're worth. If you get a client that comes in and, you know, and they, they don't necessarily want their Scotty hand stripped, but they want it to the floor and they want it to look like it should, charge okay it's not hand stripping i'll do that right but charge charge your time if they want it to look like that charge your time if you're doing it on your own time like i said and then you're buzzing the dog with a seven that's on you but if they if you get a dog comes in they like this Bichon, you know they all of a sudden decide i know he can't be but they all of a sudden decide they want a full show trim on that dog his price should be double what it is right now period because it's going to take you twice as long. You're going to have to grow it out. You're going to have to do maintenance baths, yada, 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 yada. Those clients will come eventually. They'll start trickling in. When the word gets around, they'll start trickling in. I've already sent you two or three. If they call me from out here, I don't come out here. And you're the ones I know. And you're the ones that are doing the education. So that's where I send them. Same thing, out fluffy cuts, green dog, you know, wherever. Same thing with yeah. the guys. Yeah. Green dog. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but I mean, if if you know, if you're doing if you're doing a breed standard cut on a dog, it should be charged more than a seven shave down. Period. So therefore, you're already getting paid for your time. But I used to in the beginning. I mean, I had the teeniest, tiniest toy poodle you've ever seen in your life. His name was Jingle. He was three and a half pounds. Everybody thought he was a baby Bedlington because that's the only way I could learn how to do that haircut. I put it on him. Yep. I want a best in show with him. Yep. It was fun. I loved him. He was one of my favorite, one of my favorite dogs. When he got old, I buzzed him with a 10 blade and just left his whole head and he looked like Gallagher. It was great. It was awesome.